What have you for me today, Lord? What have you for me today? It's here at your feet I want to be. What have you for me? You're listening to The Sons Are Free. The topic today is Fun with Numbers. Before retiring at 43 to serve the Lord, I was an analyst in the aerospace industry. Recently, I found myself doing a ballpark cost analysis of a mainline denomination church whose stated purpose is to deliver the message of the gospel. For the vast majority of the congregation, the pastor's sermon is the product they take home. For those whose only church involvement is in the capacity of a listener on Sundays, everything other than the sermon is overhead. The church has 500 members who collectively pay for the pastor to conduct worship services where the gospel is presented during a 20-minute sermon. Once for the traditional service where the pastor wears a robe and stole, the other during the contemporary service where the pastor wears a sport coat. That's 40 minutes of preaching the gospel per week, which amounts to 2,080 minutes per year, or 34.67 hours. Based on the standard corporate year of 2,080 hours for full time employment, the delivery of the sermon represents about 1.7% of the pastor's work year. In the interest of fairness, it's necessary to credit those 34.67 hours of preaching the gospel to the congregation who hired the pastor to preach on their behalf rather than do it themselves. Spread equally across the 500 church members amounts to 4 minutes and 10 seconds per member per year of preaching the gospel. Now, the church has an annual budget of a quarter million dollars, or the equivalent of $500 per member per year. 250 seconds of preaching per member at $500 per member breaks down to a total cost, including overhead, of $2 per second for the sermon. The rate per minute is $120 per hour, is $7,200. Each 20-minute sermon costs $2,400, which is nearly equal to the annual offering of five members. No wonder Peter left fishing for the ministry. But wait, I've made a rash assumption. The pastor only preaches in the church where everyone is already saved. So that 4-minute and 10-second credit per member per year for preaching the gospel to the lost is wiped out because it was preached to the found. In other words, the church is spending a quarter million dollars per year to reach no one. How will the members of that church fare before the judgment seat of Christ, who commands us to be good stewards of the gifts He has given to us, and to preach the gospel throughout the whole world. Personally, I think the devil laughs himself silly about it. Obviously, there are problems with my logic. Nevertheless, this flight of fancy serves to demonstrate the absurdities many of us have bought into for so long. I zeroed in on the pastor's sermon because so many of us have made it the pinnacle of the church week and we've bought into the notion that only an ordained pastor can preach. In a very real sense, much of the church is built around the pastor's message. Just look at the sanctuary and the focus of the congregation, the altar, where usually the pulpit sits center stage. Of course, there can't be a message without a church building, right? Or can there? One huge problem with the institutional church today is that ministries are often viewed in terms of 
their vehicles. A church needs a building. A traveling ministry needs a bus. A ministry abroad needs an airplane or a ship. Many of us seem to have bought into the idea that by giving our money for a vehicle, that we are giving to ministry. But vehicles and ministry are not the same. Vehicles do not accomplish ministry. People accomplish ministry. Looking to Jesus as our example for ministry, we see that Jesus didn't have a building, a bus, or an airplane. Sure, he sailed with Peter on his boat, but normally he just walked everywhere. Until Constantine the Great declared Christianity the state religion of Rome in 313 AD, Christians were violently persecuted and met in secret. There were no dedicated church buildings for the first 300 years of Christianity. And in terms of growth, those years were the most explosive. Why then do we insist on having a vehicle for ministry when they have often served to constrain ministry and thereby render Christianity impotent by diverting resources from what ministry is supposed to be, people spreading the message of Christ? Vehicles turn Christianity into church in a box, and they have become a millstone around the neck of the true church, which is people especially when we have been conditioned to think of ministry as something that can only happen in the church or that only a pastor can perform ministry. The only requirement for most ministries are dedicated Christians willing to serve. Let me illustrate the point by a confession from my ignorant past. In my early 20s, I was in a Christian band. Our lives ahead of us, we had dreams of full-time music ministry, touring the country, recording albums, and so forth. We'd written three to four songs that were pretty good considering the state of Christian music in the late 1970s. And so, with our big dreams and the naivete of youth, I began considering everything we'd need for our touring ministry. Every big-name Christian band I'd seen up to that point traveled the country in a bus with their name on the side, and so I started learning everything I could about buses. GMCs, Eagles, Prevosts, 35- and 40-foot diesel-powered vehicles, and I subscribed to two bus magazines to learn all that I could about buses. Yet there we were, with only three or four songs, while ten was the standard for an album. And even if we had ten songs, there was no money for recording and pressing an album, let alone buying a smelly old bus on its last legs. The saddest part was the time I wasted studying about buses. Time that could have been spent writing more songs, practicing, promoting concerts to reach more people. So many better ways to use my time wasted on pipe dreams about a bus with our name on the side. It wasn't long before I forgot about buses, and we turned to local ministry in the outlying areas of western Washington state. We hauled our equipment around in the back of my pickup truck. Our only investment was a public address system as we already had guitars and amplifiers. For several years, we enjoyed giving concerts at prisons, schools, churches and retirement homes, campgrounds, military bases, and private parties. What little we received from love offerings wasn't put towards a bus or an album. It was given to area food banks or returned to the host church for the poor in their congregation and we were greatly blessed for it. If you desire ministry, take your talent, your testimony, and your Bible, and put legs under them. They are the only vehicle you really need.
like it says in Isaiah 6, verse 8, Here I am. Send me. That's all for today, friends. Remember, Christ has freed us so that we may enjoy the benefits of freedom. Therefore, stand firm and let no one put you under the yoke of slavery again. Thank you for listening to The Sons Are Free. I'm Jack Helser. Until next time.